welcome to the last lecture on reinforcement learning the what I'm going to do in this particular lecture is organize all the thoughts all the different types of algorithms we have talked about within the within this course and try and understand how it all fits together uh, within the whole uh, arena of reinforcement learning so first thing I want to address is where should we apply reinforcement learning. So the underlying idea within reinforcement learning is that the environment has to be stationary uh, throughout the learning process. This is seldom true in practice. In fact, most of the environment that you would encounter um, implicitly has piecewise stationary behavior, but it is never actually stationary. So to give you an example, if you consider a wind farm, then the wind velocity changes every minutes or every 10-15 uh, minutes interval. So it's actually a piecewise stationary environment. It's never a stationary environment because the wind is never sustained um, throughout the uh, throughout uh, a significant time chunk. Same thing with uh, recommendation system. So if you start a company and you start recommending uh, things to different users the user behavior itself changes over time and perhaps more people will join your platform so over a long period of time you will see that the environment is not stationary because people adapt to all the new information they may be getting through your uh, portal or through your platform and and then they will make behavioral changes and that will make sh that will uh, result in the environment being non-stationary so therefore um, most of the environments you're going to encounter in real life will have piecewise stationary behavior and if you want to apply reinforcement learning in those situations you want to make sure that the state reaches the stationary distribution uh, as soon as possible so which means that reinforcement learning learns and implements a policy that is uh, good enough uh, for which you want to make sure that the environment reaches the steady state as soon as possible. The second uh, area where you can apply reinforcement learning is where the state space is extremely complex and you have very little model knowledge about how people are going to behave or how uh, the environment is going to behave. So those are the that's another area where reinforcement learning is very, very useful. Uh, you could also apply reinforcement learning where you have a lot of different types of reward functions. Uh, so you could, if, if you're thinking about uh, a vehicle on the road problem, then the reward is comes from safety, uh, driver comfort, passenger comfort, um, and also uh, energy requirements. So you want to minimize, say, fuel consumption. Uh, and you want to get to your destination as soon as possible. Um, you want to obey all the traffic rules. So it's like a multifaceted reward function and and those are also the situation where reinforcement learning could be useful. And then you have a rich variety of sensors and actuators. So reinforcement learning then makes perfect sense to apply in those situations because um, uh, because uh, when you have a, a large variety of sensors and actuators, you would like the algorithm to do automatic uh, data fusion and figure out what the state of the world is and then uh, make progress towards coming up with optimal strategy. Uh, the other, the, the key thing you should note is you should have the ability to gather millions of data points within minutes, hours, and days in order to be able to do reinforcement learning. And that's because the sample complexity of reinforcement learning is very, very, very high. And uh, and therefore, what people typically do is they build simulators so that they could gather lots of data points within a few seconds or a few hours. So to give you an example, one of the ride-sharing problems we are looking at, um, if you look at the number of trips taken by a vehicle, uh, uh, you know, let's say number of Uber trips within uh, the city of Columbus, it may not be significant, it may not be in millions or billions within a day, it would be in few hundred thousand, so, or even less than that. So you don't really have the ability to uh, come up with good algorithms for, say, vehicle rebalancing or some other control objective, so you have to build simulators so that you can, say, generate uh, one million trips 
within a matter of a few minutes using the simulator and then you can run reinforcement learning on top of that okay or th in the other situation could be that you get real world data where millions of data points comes every minutes or hours so if you look at ad clicks for instance um, then uh, then you could get a million data points very quickly because a lot of people around the world are doing search or clicking on ads and things like that so so those are the situations where reinforcement learning is most effective because you're not limited by the number of data points you have. So so with that, uh, you know, the usual application of reinforcement learning has been advertising and recommendation systems where it has been applied with great success. Um, then some people are exploring the use of reinforcement learning as large scale control of smart grid and wind farms and electric vehicles applications. Uh, you could also apply reinforcement learning to improve transportation services to better planning and optimization. Uh, this is something that we have been focusing on for the past uh, few years. Um, so we want to minimize fuel consumption of vehicles and we want to uh, come up with better rebalancing policies for ride-sharing vehicles uh, within a city. So, And we are trying to use reinforcement learning for those problems. Uh, we've also been exploring problems uh, of applying reinforcement learning into power electronics to improve the performance of uh, power electronic devices. So we don't quite know whether it will be successful or not, but certainly that's one area where uh, we need to do uh, learning in milliseconds or microsecond scale and then take actions uh, within microseconds or millisecond scale. So a lot of data can get generated very quickly in these power electronic devices. Um, in my personal opinion, applying reinforcement learning to robotics or playing games is not economically useful. I mean, it's, it's you know, robotics is very well understood field. So, you know, re reinforcement learning perhaps is not the right uh, tool to apply in robotics because the, um, the, the state transition function or the reward function is pretty much uh, very well known in these situations. You can hand code or come up with better algorithms to um, to do the planning and execution of tasks rather than try and use reinforcement learning um, because of the sample complexity. And playing games, uh, again, is, is not very useful because it's, uh, it's just playing games. It's not necessarily bringing food to the table or doing something significant, uh, making a significant dent into the human uh, condition. So, but nonetheless, uh, these applications have seen a lot of papers because uh, many simulators are available. So it is very easy to benchmark. You come up with a new algorithm. How do you know whether this algorithm is good or better than other algorithms that have been proposed in the literature? So one way to, is to prove theorems about it, but the other way is to run some simulations and show that your algorithm indeed works better. So, so that's why uh, some of the reinforcement learning applications have been shown on the in the area of robotics and playing games that's where most of the success stories are coming but uh, but in my personal opinion those are not the right success stories to look at um, there are three essential pillars of reinforcement learning uh, that we talked about in this particular course the first one is you want to use approximate dynamic programming with function approximators. So this was the uh, the class of theories developed in from 1950s to 1970s where dynamic programming was developed, the theory of DP was developed, and then very quickly um, many people started doing approximate dynamic programming in order to minimize the curse of dimensionality of uh, dynamic programs and to ease the computation. The second uh, pillar of reinforcement learning came from 1980s until 2010, where uh, the key idea was to use stochastic gradient descent uh, using the samples from a simulator, uh, potentially with important sampling if you're using off-policy methods, and then run reinforcement learning and do a data-driven uh, approximate dynamic programming. Uh, with function approximators and that was the second wave of uh, the, the second pillar of reinforcement learning. The third pillar was to improve sample complexity uh, where majority of the work is done post 2000 and you will uh, 
and we have we have spent considerable amount of time on uh, on all these three topics uh, within this uh, whole class so let's look at the first pillar more closely so within approximate dp uh, we have used function approximators for value function q function advantage function and policy and uh, one thing to note is that the key ideas were already laid in late 1950s early 1960s so this isn't the uh, this isn't something very novel as far as reinforcement learning is concerned the second topic which is stochastic gradient descent for regression uh, this is something that uh, people realized that they could do since 1980s because a lot of data was getting generated and computers were also available um, so the idea was to use samples from a simulator to conduct regression uh, and you could do regression in the value function space or q function space or advantage function space or you could do what you could do regression in the policy space so remember the policy gradient method where we were trying to directly use the samples to come up with an optimal policy or you could do regression in both the spaces through actor critic type approaches and we have we've seen a lot of different actor critic algorithms if you're doing off policy regression then you have to somehow in in change the weight of each sample that you have generated and that is done through important sampling so what you do is uh, the the key idea is to multiply importance weight with the stochastic gradient in order to do the regression and we have seen a lot of different uh, algorithms more more recently the td lambda algorithm with important sampling was an instantiation of this off policy regression and then we did not really cover but a lot of new algorithms have been designed that has the variance reduction uh, property which is as you run more and more simulation the variance in the uh, in the training error goes down um, so so that's known as variance reduced policy gradient method and uh, we haven't really touched upon it in the class but there are some recent work since 2017 on this topic Improving sample complexity is one of the most major open areas of reinforcement learning. Um, so we first talked about uh, multi-arm bandit problems, where we talked about different exploration schemes within multi-arm bandit. Uh, particularly, we talked about frequentist approaches and Bayesian approaches to multi-arm bandit, and there we were using regret as a proxy for sample for measuring sample complexity. So a lower regret implies that the algorithm is able to learn the approximately optimal strategy with high probability um, in fewer samples. Okay. Similarly, a high regret means that the sam sample complexity is very high for learning an approximately optimal policy. So in, in, in some sense, exploration, different exploration schemes could improve your sample complexity of the reinforcement learning, and we saw firsthand how it does that in the context of multi-arm bandit problems. Then whenever you are doing gradient descent, you should always think about Newton's method because Newton's method is much faster than gradient descent, the vanilla steepest descent method. So we did talk about approximate Newton's method in stochastic gradient descent in order to improve the sample complexity. And, and the algorithm I want to bring to your attention is ACTOR, which was a policy gradient algorithm. Um, uh, no, it was actually an actor critic algorithm to improve the sample complexity um, in uh, in reinforcement learning. Then uh, we have talked about prioritized experience replay, so that also improves the sample complexity because you're now able to use the same sample several times in your training uh, through prioritized experience replay. So, um, so that also improves. Uh, you you don't have to. Um, trash all the samples um, uh, that you have generated in the past you can reuse it in the future through um, some sort of important sampling and um, uh, and the overall idea is is embedded within the uh, topic of prioritized experience replay then we have talked about actor critic methods that also seems to improve sample complexity although there is no uh, paper that I've seen that explicitly proves that actor critic methods reduce the sample complexity. Uh, then asynchronous algorithms uh, also seem to improve the sample complexity, although 
Um, again, there is no theoretical work that proves it exactly. Uh, the idea in asynchronous algorithms, if you remember, is that you're getting trajectories from various servers, uh, and therefore you're able to generate a lot of different, a lot of samples very quickly, and that improves your learning performance, and uh, and you get to learn the optimal optimal strategy very quickly, or approximately optimal strategy very quickly in comparison to um, other algorithms that just uses a single stream of data. Uh, my understanding, my, my gut feeling is that you can find the sweet spot using gradient diversity, but I haven't really um, explored this topic very well, so perhaps something you could explore it in your future work. And then uh, one of the issues that um, we all face when we are uh, running reinforcement learning, or for that matter any learning algorithm, is to improve the stability of training. And we talked about various methods to improve the stability of training. So one is to clip importance weights if your importance weights are going to going unbounded. Then the other idea was to use actor critic method, trust region methods, where you uh, in the trust region methods you restrict your space, uh, you search for optimal policy in a very small region around the current point. Um, and then you change the objective function for estimating parameters. That's another way to improve the stability of training. And we saw uh, two temporal difference algorithms called GTD2 and TDC algorithms that have much better convergence property, um, even for nonlinear function approximators. Um, uh, and it improves the overall stability of training, which means that the training is much, much better and provably optimal. Uh, in in those situations and the other idea which is uh, uh, which comes from the regular optimization class you should decrease your step size or learning rate if your training is becoming unstable and that the reason for that um, we have discussed at length in uh, our optimization class so I won't go over it here the open question uh, right now uh, that people worry about it within the area of reinforcement learning are as follows. So first of all, uh, I highly encourage you to read the paper Deep Reinforcement Learning That Matters. One of the key challenge within the field of reinforcement learning has been uh, reproducibility, which is um, if, if you run the algorithm on your machine and it seems to do well, if I run it at my machine, it may or may not work as well. Uh, because I may use a different random seed, I may rescale uh, the reward function or I may rescale, I may use a different uh, uh, neural network for representing my policy and all of these issues uh, uh, are uh, problematic because uh, you want your algorithms to be robust to any changes a user may make uh, in the uh, within the RL framework. And unfortunately, that is not the case with deep reinforcement learning. A lot of, a lot of things come change completely if you make small changes in hyperparameters, and 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 that's a big problem within the area of reinforcement learning. So, perhaps uh, that's an open topic that you should you should perhaps undertake if you're planning to work in reinforcement learning. I highly encourage you to read this paper, Deep Reinforcement Learning That Matters. Uh, I haven't found much work on bagging and boosting in reinforcement learning, so perhaps uh, something uh, one could look at. Automatic hyperparameter adjustments, so what should the learning rate be for optimal, optimally learning the Q function or vol value function or policy function? Uh, those are the things that people haven't uh, particularly looked at, uh, so something that you may want to consider. Uh, choice of function approximators, well, Neural network is only one of many universal function approximators, so um, uh, we have some work and uh, some some uh, a group at USC that I was affiliated with earlier uh, in my postdoc. So that group has also considered many different function approximators for doing reinforcement learning. Um, so you know, just don't fixate on deep reinforcement learning and perhaps look into other function approximators as well because that could be useful for your problem. Uh, transfer learning and sim to real. So one of the issues with reinforcement learning is that if you learn, if you train your algorithm on one system, uh, how do you use the learned policy or learned 
value function onto another system which differs slightly from the model that you had trained on at the very beginning. And then that's transfer learning and then sim to real is if you have trained a model in simulation and you put it into practice, you, you code it, code an FPGA, put that policy in there, uh, would that policy work well in practice as well? So these are, uh, so someone who is more interested in implementing it in real world should perhaps, implementing algorithms in real world should perhaps take a look into these topics uh, because it's very important. We don't want to come up with reinforcement learning algorithms that are completely useless in practice and uh, is not robust to the environmental uncertainties. So uh, quite a few work has been done on this topic. So we did not discuss it in the class. So it's not really uh, something that no one has looked at, uh, but we don't yet have satisfactory answers to these questions. And the, the last topic I want to um, discuss is reward morphing. And the idea in reward morphing is uh, very interesting. So when you try to, so, so consider a kid who wants to learn how to run, but before the kid learns how to run, they need to learn how to stand up, how to walk, and then they learn how to run. So if you start with a robot who doesn't know anything and you want to make it run, it's not good if you design your reward function for running and then start training re start training the the robot to to uh, to start running directly perhaps you should initially give the robot a reward to stand up and then you give a reward to walk and then you give rewards to run so that's called reward morphing and that could potentially be a useful approach to train or to come up with a training algorithm for very, very complicated system um, uh, by changing the rewards over time and not just give it the final reward at the very beginning because then the training is going to be very, very noisy and not directed. So those are the open questions I wanted to discuss uh, uh, in reinforcement learning. These are not the only ones. But uh, I think if you're looking into a career in reinforcement learning, then these are the topics you should definitely think about in your future research. So with this, uh, I end the course on reinforcement learning. It was a great fun to teach this class and learn from you all. It's really unfortunate that because of COVID-19, I was not able to take this class in person because in person teaching is much more fun than online teaching but nonetheless uh, we've been able to manage this semester well so that's a good thing and hopefully I'll see you in other courses uh, in the subsequent semesters.